Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So here I'm going to do a complete breakthrough and run through of the Maths A paper for H and this was from the January 2017. Okay, so once again, this is a calculator test. Just like every other test, they're all going to be calculated, so you don't even need to worry about that. So you could just show a baby working out and just smash it in the calculator unless it tells you to show working out. So what do we need here? So there's going to be, well, okay, first things first, we have the formulas as usual. You're given Pythagoras, trigonometry, you're given the volume and the surface area of a cone, so L being the, the hypotenuse. So this L calculation can be found using Pythagoras theorem. You've got sphere equations. You've got some nice triangle with sine, cosine, area, triangle formula. And again, you've got the prisms, circles, cylinders. You've got the whole lot. And most importantly, you've got trapezium and quadratic. Because quadratic you're going to be using quite a bit, at least once or twice. But yeah, let's jump straight in here. Yeah? Let's do this. So we have to answer 21 questions paper. So that's actually good because the average is usually 22. So you've got one less here. So let's try and kill this in an hour or less. Now, number one, the table below shows information about the number of goals scored by a football club in each of its last 45 games. Okay, so we can see that the frequency here should, be, should have a total of 45 games. So we can put a sum of 45. Okay, good. And this is the number of goals scored in each of the games. So... In seven of the games, nobody scored. And then, for example, in 10 of the games, three goals were scored. Cool. And this was obviously the best game. And in only one game, five, six goals were scored. So, question. Find the median number of goals. Show your work clearly. So, to find the median number, all you simply do is check out the number of games and divide it by two. And then that's going to be the midpoint position. So here you can say, let's just let's estimate, we can say 45 over 2 will be the position we're at. So this would be this position. Put this in the calculator, you, sh you should find out that we, we only care about the 22.5th goal. So basically we need to know what the 22nd and 23rd goal was. And let's assume this was the, the, the order, yeah? So from ascending order, we start from 7. So we can see from the first game, 7 goals are scored. So this goes up to the 7th. In the next game, um, 14 goals are scored. So this would be a total of 21. So here we've got 21 goals scored. Now clearly, it must be in the next group because if you add 8, then altogether, 29 goals were scored at this point. So that means the median must be in this group. So we can say that the median number of goals was clearly 2. So the answer is 2. Okay, question 2. So here is a bias 5 spinner. Side, five sided spinner. So you've got, you've got red, blue, orange, green, yellow. So it looks quite fair, not really biased, but it is biased. So when a, when a spin is spun, it can land on red, orange, yellow, green, or blue. So the properties are given below. So, okay, so we've got 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1 for red, orange, and yellow, respectively. We need to know what green and blue is. One thing to know is that all the properties must add up to 1. Okay, so so far this totals up to 0 0.7. Okay, so the property that the spinner lands on green is the same as the property that lands on blue. Alright, so it's easy. So because green and blue make 0 0.3, therefore we need to half them. And this should give us 0.15 each. So let's write here. 1, 0 0.15, 0 0.15. Easy, actually. Oh, seriously, this is um, three marks of that. Okay, Michael spins the spinner once. Work a property that the spinner lands on green. Okay. So Jenny spins the spinner 200 times. Work out an estimate for the number of times the spinner lands on red. So the property lands on red is 0 0.4. And because you're doing it 200 times, you've got a property of landing 0 0.4 for 200 times. And that's it. You literally just worked this out. So in other words, um, this is the same as 4 times 20, which is 80. So you have a property of getting it. 80 times. Easy. Let me just put it here. 0 0.15. Really? Three marks of that? Two marks? This is dead easy. Okay, question three. So the weekly rent for holiday apartment is 530 pounds, which is the same as 715.5 euros. Let's write that down. So 530 pounds is equivalent to 17.5 euros. The weekly rent for holiday cottage, cottage is £750. Using the same rate of currency, work out the weekly rent for the cottage in euros. 
So just find the value of 750 pound in euros. Well, first things first, what I would always do before I get the 750, I would work out what every pound is worth. To do that, we just divide it by 530. So literally, you need to divide both sides by 530 to find the euro equivalent. And then to work out what 750 pound is, you just multiply this value by 750. So doing that fraction and then timesing it by um, 750, you should get... 1,000, oh that's a lot, <laughs> too bad, this, this is not actually true, 1,012.5 euros. In real life, the actual rate is nowhere near that, it's like 1 to 1 at this stage. So I'll just, yeah, I'll just write it here. Okay, next one. Okay, number 4. So use your calculator to work out the value of this. Okay, so calculate practice guys, so let's just smash it all in. So make sure you use the fraction button, so in your calculator use this button all the time, yeah? It should look something like this. If you've got a different calculator, maybe the other calculator looks like this. This is this would be in another button. But anyway, start with that button first and enter it in. So 16 squared over 3 times 12 minus pi. And use the pi button too. Now, putting all these figures down, I got 7.79100 Something like that. Now round this to three cinema figures. So we just care about the first three figures and then we and then the fourth number is at the side up. Because it's less than five, it's just gonna be seven point oops. Oops, oops, oops seven point seven nine. Cool. Now work this value out. So <laughs> good thing is a calculator. So you can probably just smash that in your calculator as well. So four point two times ten to the power of four over seven oops. Over seven hundred thousand. So in my calculator, I got exactly three over fifty. Oh, why is it doing that? So three over. I think when I hold it too hard, it does that, which is the same as zero point zero six. In a standard form, well, you just count how many zeros back because you because you're working the decimal and it's on the zero point. It's the same as saying six times ten to the power negative two. We got two zeros behind the value six, so this means we've gone back by two two positions. So this this is how I do it personally. There is a, there is a secondary method, which is just to literally put the point here and go back twice. But I count the zeros, and that's it. Okay, question five. So Abri walks along a path from her home to a local village. Okay, so we can see on the diagram we've got home here, local village up here. Here is the distance time go for a journey from her home to the village. So by the time she goes, starts from home at 12 o'clock, it takes exactly one hour to get to the village. And this, this is a journey of 3.5 kilometers. So what else do we have? So we know that so we have another person, Benito. Benito le leaves the village at 12.30 and walks at a constant speed. So constant speed means you're traveling in a straight line along the same path to Abri's home. He arrives at Abri's home at 13.15 and 1.15 p.m. Show this information about Benito's journey on the grid. So if he leaves the village at 12.30, he's over here and he needs to go to, um, he needs to be at, at uh, Abri's home at 12, 13, 15. So this is 13, 15. So it's bang in the middle of the, of, 30, of 1 o'clock and 1.30. So it should be something like that. Yeah, looks good. Okay, so how far from the village were Abri and Benito when they passed each other? So they passed each other around the 2.5 kilometer mark that means in the village at 3.5 so it's it's a difference between 2.5 and 3.5 so the difference was one kilometer okay quite easy six so a has coordinates 11 3 e and b has coordinates 1 7 e the midpoint of a b has coordinates x y find value x oh, midpoint is easy it just um you simply add some of these two values and divide them by two it's the value bang in the middle so the midpoint is going to be, say, for the x-coordinate, 11, add 1, then you half it. And then for the y, it'll be 3e, add 7e, then you half them. So this should give us, so 11 plus 1 is 12, half of 12 is 6. For y, it'll be 3e plus 7e is 10e, half of 10e is 5e. And what they want us to find x value, so it's just 6. So find the expression of y in terms of e, so it's 5e. 
Well, this, is, this is the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> Question seven. So we've got the union of P and Q given by the following which is A, B, C, D, E, F. So these are the elements when, they, when P and Q are combined. And the intersection between P and Q is E. So you've got to think of it as this. It's two, two vents here. One P and one Q. And this is telling us that um, when they're intersecting, which is the middle part, they have E. But then the combination of P and Q, so all these combined, will have these elements. So we also know that A belongs in P, C belongs in Q. F doesn't belong in P, but B, D intersects with Q. And that's, that leads us to nothing, an empty set, so that doesn't belong in here. Okay, so B and D does not, when it intersects with Q, does not belong in there. So this means that B and D must be strictly P. We also know that uh, C belongs in Q. We know that A belongs in P. F doesn't belong in P, so it probably belongs in Q. And yeah, that looks that looks about right, doesn't it? So list all the members of the set P. So in set P, we've got A, B, D, E. I'll put it here A, B, D, E. And of Q is, is going to be C, E, F. C, E, F. Oh, that's it. That's an E, yeah. Okay, question A. So what do we have here? Oh, so it looks like we're dealing with bearings here. So we've got a diagram that shows point A and point B on a map. So A and B are just both pointing north. The bearing of C from B is 235 degrees and point C is due south of A. So because it's due south, it's somewhere along this line. And because the angle C, the bearing of C is from B is 235 degrees, this means that um, if we have to draw a line, so hold on, let me just get a straight edge here. Okay, line. So we're looking at somewhere here. So this is uh, 90 degrees, 180, and 270. So 235 must be around here somewhere. Just going to assume. And I haven't got a compass to make this accurate because I don't have to get a compass here. So just for the sake of making our life easy, I think the direction is here. Okay, so because it's here, then I can draw an arrow now. And just say the bearing, that uh, point C is here. And we can just draw a north sign north and just call this point c okay that's that's what i think here yeah? i mean honestly if we had a compass this would be easier anyway now the bearing of a point d from b is 168 degrees okay find the bearing of b from d so bearing of point d from b is 168 degrees so now where's 168 degrees going to be again so once again get straight edge so I'll say, again, this is 90, 180, so I don't know. It'll be somewhere around here, probably, just before 180 degrees, yeah? I mean, that, that, seems, that seems totally legit to me. So then we just draw a straight arrow up, call it north. So, 168 degrees, yeah, makes sense. Now, if you're going to go straight back to B, so now you want to find a bearing from B to D. You need to go all the way around. So to go back to that, you need to go a full length round, which is 180 plus length here. So yeah, so clearly this obviously must be, um, if you think about carefully, this would be 180 degrees plus 160 again. So the solution here would be um, 180 plus the original bearing. And this should give us, or well, just 12 degrees short of 360, which is on my calculator, I can work it out, 348 degrees. Sweet. Okay, so next one. Gordon measures the length on the map at 6.3 centimeters, so correct to 1 dp. So this sounds like an upper lower bound. Write down the lower bound. Uh, this is straightforward. You just need a value to round up to 6.3, and that could be 6.25, because that's one bound, and technically the other bound would be um, 6.35. So just less than 6.35 will great equals 6.25. But clearly it's 6.25 because it's the lower bound. All right, let's move on, guys. Okay, here we are. Question nine. So the diagram shows a ladder EF leaning against a vertical wall. So this is the ladder EF. The foot E of the ladder is, is on the horizontal ground. Cool. And we're given some information. 
So we know that so we need to work out the length of the ladder and give an answer to 1 dp. So as usual, let's just call the length of the ladder um, x. Okay. This is straight up Pythagoras' theorem. Nothing really complicated about this. So the usual formula is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c squared is hypotenuse. So I could just you know put c squared here, and this is equal to a squared plus b squared. Oh yeah, and by the way, this is given in the formula sheet in the back, so you don't really need to memorize work this, memorize this, but it's an easy formula. And just solve this. So multiply this in your calculator and then square root answer. You should get this. So I'm doing it right now. Square root of final answer, guys, and you should get what was it to one dp? Yeah, so you should get 4.1 meters. I'll put 4.1 meters. Easy part B work out the size of angle EFG. Where's the EFG? So EFG, let's call this theta. Yeah, and to the nearest degree. Okay, let's just do up here. So when we do when we do this problem, we need to use um, trigonometry. So our best, uh, you know, best course action is to use so ka toa. Okay, so what we're we interested in. So because the angle is here, the angle, the length opposite angle is known as the opposite op, and we can just use the length here, which is um, the adjacent, the one next to the opposite. And the x is the hypotenuse. But let's just use the non the answers we're given for a more exact answer. So therefore, because we got op and adjacent, we can use toa because toa has op. And adjacent so our solution is going to uh, our equation is going to be tan theta equals op over adjacent now all you have to do is pretty much uh, tan inverse this so in your calculator theta would be the tan inverse of this of this value so that will give us um, tan inverse of 2.1 over 3.5 and according to my calculation I got exactly 30.96 degrees and over here to the nearest degree, because I know we're going to round it, would be 31. Cool. Free, see, this is easy free marks. This is easy free marks. All right. Number 10. Simultaneous equation. God, I love these kind of equations. And this one is quite easy, because it's all laid out for you. So you've got 5x take away 2x give you 33. 5x plus 8y will give you 18. So all you want to do, because 5x is already sorted, you could just subtract these. Why? Because you, they both have 5x. Let me just make it clear. So subtracting both of these, what do we have? 5x take away 5x would be gone. Minus 2y take away 8y will give us minus 10y. So remember, you're subtracting. 33 take away 18. Mentally, I think it's 15. And that's it. So therefore, y must be, dividing minus 10, y must be 15 over negative 10. And putting this in a calculator, you should get minus 3 over 2. All right, and yeah, of course, now you want to find x. So just plug into equation of x. So pl let's plug into the first equation because the, the negatives make it positive. So therefore, plug into the first equation, you're going to get 5x minus 2 times minus 3 over 2 equals 33. So this is going to give us 5x. Put this in a calculator, you're going to get positive 3 equals 33. And just solving this directly, you should get x equals, so subtracting 3 and dividing 5, you should get 6. And that's it. Okay, here we go. So, it looks like we're given um, a transformation kind of problem. So what do we have? So, on the grid, we want to reflect this triangle Q in the line x equals 1. Okay, and we need to label this R. So easy, so where's x equals 1? Well, x equals 1 is cutting through here so what we could do just get a straight line which I'm gonna do right now and just draw an x equals one line so it has a cut x equals one okay so we make this a bit straight okay now what you want to do here guys is simply reflect this across so you could say that this point here so let me get a pen this point here is reflected on here so it becomes so it's two blocks away so it's gonna be two blocks here this part is, God knows how many blocks, four blocks away, so it's here. And you can just kind of guesstimate shape. This is two blocks above, so this must be here. And now you just connect the whole thing. So let me see if I've got something I can connect the whole thing. Connected lines, good. So, oh no, not like, oh God. So yeah, let me, you know, I'm just gonna do a freestyle here, because sometimes it's just, no, I won't. So just drawing the whole shape together. So just, 
Ah, screw it. Pen. So like this, like this, and so you know from an exam is you know because I'm it's all done on a PDF. Here we go. And that's it, we just call this um, R. Easy. Now, what else you want to do? So from triangle R, we can, it says triangle R is mapped onto triangle S by reflection in the Y equals zero axis. So Y equals zero means um, is this straight line here. So what we could do, get another straight line and label Y equals zero, and that is this line. It's literally the X axis, reflect across X axis. And just to make it clear, by reflection. So describe fully this transformation that maps triangle Q onto S. So let's draw this out firstly, the, the new reflection, and then let's see what happens. So I'll change the color of the pen as well. Okay, so we're gonna have, um, so basically this, this lot move across here, because this is an easy transformation. And this long point goes three blocks up, so it's here. Now you just connect the whole shape. And this could be called S. Now, how do we get from Q to S? Well, ooh, if you look carefully, it looks like a rotation, actually, like a clear rotation. It's even a reflection across the Y equals X axis, or it's a rotation of 180 degrees. Both is fine, I believe. So you could say a rotation, and this is the center. You can see this seems to be the center. So if we're going to put this in words, let me get my pen or my words. So, transformation, move this out of the way, from Q, oops, from Q to S is a rotation of 180 degrees, you don't even, let's just say clockwise, or anti-clockwise, because it's the same thing, clockwise. Um, from center, and that seems to be a corner of one zero. And that's it, guys. That's that's literally all you have to say. From center one zero. Easy, isn't it? Well, let's move on. That's it. Well, let's move on. Okay, here we are, guys. So we've got a straight line with this given equation. Very straightforward equation. Find the gradient of L. Well, with gradient equations, we need to put in this form y equals mx plus c. That means we just need to rewrite this equation in this form. To do that, we need to isolate two uh, y by itself. So let's do this. So let's firstly uh, subtract 3x and then divide by minus 2. And what does that give us? So we're going to get minus 2y equals 15 minus 3x. Now just flip in the order. And, yeah, and then dividing by minus 2, we should get y equals, what do we get here? So half of, 70, half of 15, you know, let's just say minus 15 over 2. And then divide this by minus 2, you should get plus 3 over 2x. So the gradient is the m in front of the x. And this is the y-intercept. So even though I put a second, remember, it's the mx. The mx is 3 over 2x. So clearly it's 3 over 2. Straightforward. Now find the corners of the, of the point where l crosses the y-axis. If it crosses the y-axis, if you think about it carefully, if it crosses, let's just say, I don't know, the equation is positive gradient, so... No, it's, it's probably something like this. If it crosses the y-axis, the y-axis is here. This happens when x, if you think about it, when x equals 0. So all you have to do is plug in x equals 0. And now this is common sense as well, because this is also um, the y-intercept. So it's minus 15 over 2. So the coincidence is clearly 0 minus 15 over 2. Find an equation of the line that is parallel to L and crosses this point. So when something is parallel, it means equal gradient and just different intercept. So let's, let's rewrite this equation down there. So we have y equals um, 3 over 2x minus 15 over 2x. Oh, uh, no. Oopsie. My, plus c. We should say plus c because we don't know the new gradient. 3 over 2x plus c. And we know that this line passes through minus 2, 0. Okay, so all we have to do really is just find the value c by plugging in this coordinate. So when x is minus 2 and y is 0, we can find c. So we're going to have 0 equals 3 over 2 minus 2 plus c. Now you just solve it. 
if you if you solve this one, you're going to get negative 3. So you've got 0 equals negative 3 plus C. So therefore, C is clearly 3. And then your final equation is just going to be Y equals 3 over 2X plus 3. I'll just write it down here. Y equals 3 over 2X plus 3. Easy, man. So easy. Okay. Okay, question 13, guys. So what do we have here? So it looks like we were dealing with a circle geometry based problem. Okay, good. So, and it, we're given some information on in the bottom left corner. It tells us that B, D, and E are points in the circle with center O. So B, D, E is, is over here. A, B, C is a tangent to the circle, meaning A, B, O is 90 degrees. So a tangent, when you, when you have a tangent, it's always perpendicular to the center circle, at least when the straight line is connected to it. So this part would be 11. So 79 and 11 will make a right angle. We also know that DEC is a straight line, good, and we're given two angles. Now, here it tells us to write down the size of angle BED. Okay, so BED is actually over here. And actually, just to know, if you know your circle theorem properties, then you'll recognize that this property here is part of the alternate angle theorem, which tells us that one angle one side of the chord, which is 79, is equal to the angle on the other side of the chord, which is here, 79 too. So actually BED automatically is 79 degrees. So I could just write it here. Also, just to verify this property, I would like you to look at this diagram. So over here, I've got some properties, in particular number nine, and this is from the CGP book. It tells us the ultimate alternate angle segment theorem. The angle between a tangent and a chord is always equal to the angle in the opposite segment, i.e. The angle in this part, as you can see, which is divided by tangent, is equal to the angle in the far corner in the opposite segment. You can think of this as two shaded parts. You've got the, the, the purple region, which, is, which includes the angle region, and the other side behind this chord, which will give you the identical angle. And this is right. It's probably the hardest rule to learn, so definitely memorize this property. Okay, so going back, let's have a look. So that's okay. So this is the ultimate angle segment. With one mark. Now we, here we need to work out the size of angle BOE. So BOE is actually, well, it's actually quite straightforward. So this is literally, um, there's another theorem for this one, which states that this angle is twice the angle of this angle here. And it helps because this would literally be 2x. Another good thing to know is that because this is a straight line, we already know this angle here. This angle here is going to be 11 degrees. And we know this because, if you think about it, this is the right, this is a right angle to the tangent. It always is. And it tells us over here, ABC is a tangent to the circle. So that's good. Now, by, de by definition, we, we need to just literally f figure out this angle here. And thankfully, we have another angle which says 49 there. Yeah, so as I was saying, this was 2x, so this must be x. Another thing to notice is that Remember, angles around a straight line is 180. Because we know this is 79, that means um, the full length, including 11, all the way up to here, would be um, 180 minus 79. And this should be uh, 101 degrees. So we can say angle, angle D, B, C, which is this part I just mentioned, is 180 minus 79. And this should give us 101. So therefore, if we look at triangle, we have 101, 41, and x. So we can say x plus 101 plus 41 must equal 180. Therefore, subtracting 101, 41 across, x will give us 38. And therefore, knowing that this angle here is twice, the angle in the center is twice the angle at the circumference, therefore 2x, which is the angle we care about, is going to be double, which is 76 degrees. And that's it guys, let's move on. So, you should write over here, 76. Okay, question 14. So my favorite kind of question is tree diagrams. So there are 52 cards in a pack. 12 cards are picture cards and 40 are number cards, okay? Melina takes at random a card from the pack. She keeps the card and then takes at random a second card from the remainder of the pack. Okay, so she takes one and takes another one. So that means in the beginning, it's gonna be there's going to be 52 cards, and then as she takes one, it'll be 51. So she got 12 and 40 picture number cards, respectively. That means in the beginning, she would have 12 out of 50 
to picture cards and 40 out of 52 number cards. That means when she takes another picture card again, and it should be down to 11 over 51. Because she removes one card from the pack, and you take in a picture card, you're left with 11. That means at this stage, you're still left with 40 number cards. And you remember, this part's all over 51. So we can just write right now, everything's going to be divided by 51. Because that's where we're at. Now, if you chose a number card, that means you're left with exactly 39 number cards at your second stage. Of course, you still got all your picture cards, so you're still at 12. And that's it, that should be the end of the tree diagram. It should look something like this. So from the first to the second card. Now, B, work out the probability that the two cards Melina takes are both picture cards or both number cards. So to get two both picture cards, this is saying that the probability needs to be a picture card and then another picture card. Alternatively, she needs to get either a number card or a number card. So we're just going to follow the tree trunks that follows picture picture. So easy, guys. So the only way to get picture picture is to follow this, this probability and this probability. So let's multiply these two together. So you should have 12 over 52 times 11 over 51. If you're taking the number card root, well, we're just going to follow this root here. 40 and then 39. So this would be 40 out of 52 times 39 out of 51. Now all you have to do is literally just multiply this in your calculator, get a result, multiply this and then total them up. So what do we get? So since we're here, let's just calculate. So we should get um, hmm, 12 over 52 times 11 over 51. So my first result here would be simplified. 11 over 221. So this is all done in the calculator. Yeah? Next one would be 40 times 39 over 52 times 51. And the second result goes 10 over 17. And then if you add them up, you should get exactly one. What they want is a probability. So you should get 141 out of 221. Decimal wise or, or percentage wise, that's about 63.8%. Yeah, so that's the probability of getting both of the same cards of, of either rules. Yeah, let's go. Okay, 15. So here we're looking at vectors now. So this one looks like an interesting question. So it says here we're given a vector from A to B as it moved, moves 3 across in the x-axis and y across in the, and 2 across in the y-axis. Well, A to C moves 4 across and 1 down. So A to C, 4 across, 1 down. Okay. Find the column vector BC. Okay, so here we want to find BC. Well, to get to BC, we can literally, we have to start B and just make our way to C. So since we know AB goes in this direction, it's 3, 2. Whereas um, AC is going in this direction, which is 4 and negative 1. So all we have to do is simply go to, from B, go to A, and then go to C. So this would equal... If we travel from B to A first, plus then A to C. Since B to A is the reverse of this of these values, it'll be negative and then 3 over 2. So it'll be negative vector 3, 2, plus and AC is of course the same, 4, minus 1. And all we do is literally just add up the columns. So this means minus 3 plus 4 is going to be positive 1. Minus 2 minus 1 is going to be negative 3. So that is our column vector for BC. So just simple vector addition. Now, BCDE is a parallelogram. And it tells us that CD is twice the length of, a of 2AC. So let's have a look at CD for a second. So CD is twice the length of um, 2AC. So CD of twice the length of AC. So wherever AC is, CD is going to be 2 times our value. So it's going to be 8, negative 2. Okay. Give your answers. So find the length of CE. So where's CE? So now we need to somehow get to CE. And notice, because this entire diagram is up, so what does it say? So we know that BCD is a parallelogram. So since BCD is a parallelogram, this tells us that this direction is the same as this direction. So this is also going to be 8, negative 2. 
that BC is the same as ED and that's okay but all we really care about is really to find the length is that correct is to find the length of um, CE so first things first let's find the value of CE let's find the vector of CE so how do we get from C to E well we can go from we can go backwards from CB and then add BE so it'll be CB then BE so we can say we need let me write down again so we go CB plus BE so CB plus BE and what does this give us? well CB is going to be negative it's going to be negative um, this value so it'll be minus 1 plus 3 so it'll be opposite and then BE is just going to be the, the, the vector 8 minus 2 so that'll be 8 minus 2 and then adding these up, well, minus 1 at 8 is 7, 3 plus minus 2 is positive 1. And that's it, we've got a vector now. All we need to do is to, to, to find an actual length for this vector, we need to calculate the magnitude. And we use that using the Pythagoras method. We say that the magnitude, let's call it, um, let's call it m for the sake of it, is going to be the square root of 7 squared, the length 7 squared plus the length 1 squared. And in calculating this, this will give us 49 and 1, so it'll be root 50. And then putting root 50 in your calculator, you should get exactly, towards it, so two decimal places, about 7.1 units or something. And that's it. That's literally question 15 in a nutshell. Okay, it's question 16. So we've got g equals 2 to the power of 3 times 3 times 7 squared. And we've got a value of h, which is 2 times 3 times 7 cubed. So they're all given in prime factors. Express g h as a product of its prime factors. Easy. So g h means g times h. So all we really are doing is multiplying the powers. So 2 power 3 times 2 will give us 2 to the power 4. 3 times 3 is 3 squared. 7 squared times 7 cubed is 7 to the power 5. Easy. Next. Now we want to divide it, g over h. So find the value a, b, and the value c. Easy. So let's just divide the powers now. So g over h, what do we get here? So let's have a look. I think I have to scroll up again. So 2 cubed times 3 times 7 squared. Actually, you know what? We can just write the answers directly, isn't it? So dividing g by h, we should get 2 squared. 3's will cancel out, and we're left with 7. And then 2 take away 3 is minus 1. So we're left with 7 to negative 1. So the solution for this one here... It's going to give us 2 squared times, and then 3 cancels out, so you can just say 3 to the power 0, because that's they, they both disappear, times 7 to the power of minus 1. That means the values of each one is going to be 2, 0, and negative 1. C. All right, so it's now. Show that 7 minus 2 root 5 times 7 plus 2 root 5 gives you 29. Okay, all right, so because this looks like a difference of two square problem, doesn't it? But anyway, let's expand this. So using the four method times each one across. And let's do the same over here. So seven times seven is going to give us 49. Seven times plus two root five is going to give us plus 14 root five. Same thing applies. Oh, no. But it's going to give us a negative 14 root Five. And lastly, the last two values, minus 2 root 5 times plus 2 root 5 will give us negative 4 times 5. Because remember, this, remember the root 5, because they're the same, becomes a whole 5. And now let's just tidy this up. Well, these two become 0. They become 0 because plus, because the plus and minus cancel out. And this one here becomes 20. So now we've got negative 20. So 49 minus 20 will give us 29. And that's it. Done. Okay, part D, guys. So now we need to find the value of n. And to do that, we need to rewrite the left-hand side to make it look like the right. So what do we do? Well, first things first, what is this? What is this? this is 1 over the cube root of 9 to the power 4. So now just looking at the bottom part for a second, yeah? We can see that the bottom part is 9 to the power 4, all cube root. That's the same as exactly 9 to the power 4 over 3. This is because the cube root is always a third of a power. So if you take the third of, of four, you get four thirds. So that's okay. 
And now, because it's 1 over, this automatically means it's going to be a negative power, because negative powers are always 1 over, yeah? So let me just write down negative powers is 1 over something. That's how it works, yeah? So it doesn't mean it's a negative number, it just means it's 1 over, literally that. And now, what do we have? So now we have the, the equation 9 to the power of negative 4 over 3 must equal 3 to the power of n. So, hmm, we're not quite done yet, actually. We're not quite done. There's two ways to do this. One, I would um, sort out the right side and make it equal to the top. Or I could sort out the 9. So what we could do is, firstly, how do we get 3 to 9? Well, we can do this by squaring. So if we, if we think about it, if we chose to um, rewrite 9, 9 is the same as 3 squared, correct? So that means replacing 9, 3 squared, we should have 3 squared to the power of minus 4 over 3 and if we work this if we actually simplify this 2 times minus 4 over 3 is just 3 to the power of minus 8 over 3 and that's it guys that's literally the power of n so we can see that clearly n is the same as minus 8 over 3 and that's it that's it that was a challenging one but that was good so let's move on okay 17 so a particle moves along a straight line the fixed point o lies on this line the displacement of the particle from O at time t seconds is s meters, where s is given by this time equation. Now we need now here it asks us to find the velocity of the particle at time five seconds. So first things first, how do we get the velocity from a displacement equation? Well, thankfully this is just um, a coded question of differentiation. So this is a differentiation topic. Anytime you deal with displacement. Uh, velocity or acceleration usually in terms of equations you're doing you're dealing with differentiation so we could say firstly that the velocity is actually the derivative or in this case you can say the change in the displacement which is s over the change in time which is the same as in this case the derivative of s over the derivative of t over ds over dt remember this delta is actually the same as d it's just a greek version of d so that's it. So all we want to do is just differentiate this equation and then replace the time at 5 to get the velocity at time 5. Now, one thing you probably know is that we're dealing with um, a, a fractional um, derivative. How, how are we going to solve the 9 over t? Well, first thing so we need to recognize that 9 over t is the same as 9 times t to the power minus 1 in, in, in um, indice form. Because remember, negative powers means 1 over. So you need to be able to spot this here. Yeah? 9 over t is the same as this. Now let's let's go ahead and differentiate this whole equation. So this tells us now that if we're going to differentiate this, 4t squared, drop the power 2, you get 8t. And now minus 9, so this will be now minus 9t power negative 1. First you drop negative 1, so become a positive 9. And you subtract 1 from the power, it becomes minus 2. And that's it. Now all you want to do is literally plug in t at 5, so therefore you can say t at time 5 would equal 8 times 5 plus, and then if you write this in indice form again, in this normal form, this is just 9 over t squared, which is 5 squared. Again, you could just smash this in the calculator and put power 2 to get your answer. And then doing all this, oops, oh, why does it keep doing that? Then doing all this in your calculator, you should get this. So let me do it actually right now because I ain't done this. 9 plus 9 over 5 squared. So you should get... So what's this velocity? So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this in exact in the decimal form. So you should get forty point three six. So I'll put here forty point three six meters per second. And that's it, guys. Hope this helped. Let's move on. Okay, question eighteen. So it looks like my mark from the previous question came here. So we're given a function such that the function equals two x over three x plus five. And part A wants us to find the function at the point minus 2. So you just plug in x equals minus 2 here. So when x equals minus 2, so plug into this value, f minus 2 will give us, so this is what you're going to get. So plug in x equals minus 2 here, you can get 2 times minus 2 over 3 times minus 2 plus 5. You should get 4. Okay. Now, the function g is given by this. Find the, the inverse g at a point 6. So this is a two-step problem. First, we need to find the inverse function. So the easiest way to do this is to flip the letters around. So if I also rewrite this whole equation, 
I would put this as the X and this as a, as a Y and you want to make Y the subject so now we're gonna have X equals 3 over Y plus 4 now to solve this um, all you have to do is times Y plus 4 across so we're gonna have let's do it up here X times Y plus 4 equals 3 and now we just make y the subject, so divide by x and subtract 4. So y plus 4 equals 3 over x, therefore y equals 3 over x minus 4. And now you can just call this g inverse, so therefore g inverse of x equals 3 over x minus 4. And just plug in the value of 6 in now, so when x equals 6, this whole equation, so g minus 1, whoa, that was a bit weird, g minus 1, 6 equals, um, so you get 3 over 6, which is half, so then you're left with um, half minus 4, just put this in the calculator anyway, you should get minus 7 over 2, so minus 7 over 2, yeah, a bit tricky. Now next one, find a function fg minus 5 so this means you want to plug in g minus 5 so g minus 5 into f so first things first to do this easily just find the value g minus 5 and then plug into f so when you put minus 5 in g what do you get so this part becomes 3 over minus 5 plus 1 so the inside pump becomes 3 over minus 5 what was the fraction again plus 4 this one looks quite easy mentally. The bottom gives you negative 1. 3 over minus 1 is just minus 3. So therefore, the function, you're going you're gonna to put minus 3 into f. So this will give us now f minus 3. So put minus 3 into the f function, which is the very first one. So 2 times minus 3 over 3 times minus 3 plus 5. So let's put that over here. So be, let, me, let me write the whole function down. 2x over 3x plus 5 over 3x plus 5 therefore f minus 3 equals so place x is minus 3 you're gonna get 2 times minus 3 over 3 times minus 3 plus 5 and well i got 3 over 2 so therefore your final answer for this one is 3 over 2 yeah i think i think that's it really Let's move on. Oh, we still got more. D. Solve this equation. Fx equals gx. God. So we have to equate these two equations. So 2x over 3x plus 5. Okay, part D. So we, got, we have to solve the equation fx equals gx. Huh. Show clear algebra working. Okay, so that seems like not too bad. So we just have to equate both functions and solve for x. So we have to equate this function with this function. So it look like 2x over 3x plus 5 equals 3 over x plus 4. Okay, let me just quickly write that down. So, two, so let me see. 2x over 3x plus 5. Let's have a go, guys, yeah? So where's my pen? Okay. 2x over 3x plus 5 is equal to... And the gx equation was 3 over x plus 4. 3 over x plus 4. Okay, so the fast and easy way to do this is to cross multiply, yeah? So I would multiply this side across, multiply everything by 3x plus 5, so this cancels and it appears here. Multiply x plus 4, so this cancels and it appears on the left. So in one four swoop, it should look like this. 2x times x plus 4 equals 3 times 3x plus 5. Now expanding this quickly, you should get 2x squared plus 8x equals, and this side should give us 9x plus 15 easy now let's subtract 9x and 15 across so we can put everything on the left hand side so therefore we should have 2x squared so ax take with 9x is minus 1x and then minus 15 across and that's it so this is our equation now we just have to factorize this so the easy way to factorize this so i'm just going to use the space underneath who cares and then you can put your answer there so to factorize this part what do we need to do well um, let's see. So we need to put a double bracket method. So first we're going to put 2x here 
and x here and then we need to ask ourselves what two numbers we need to multiply to make 15 so this could be a combination of uh, 3 and 5 or it could be a combination of 1 and 15 that's, that's all I can see now we need to we need to we need to multiply one of these two numbers by 2 remember because 2x needs to multiply something to give us a double value so multiply something by 2 that will give us a difference of 1 I could see straight away that we cannot use this because if you took times this by 2 you'll get a difference of 13 times by 2 boy you get a big difference but in this equation if you times 3 by 2 that is if you plug in the the, the, the 3 here so it'll be 2 times 3 you get 6 and we know that 6 and 5 can make a difference of 1 so this will have a difference of 1 that's exactly what we want so we can put 3 here happily and we can stick 5 where it multiplies x and that's it if you check it out 2x times 3 will give you 6x 5 times x will give you 5x and to get minus x you need to do minus 6x plus 5x will give you negative 1 and therefore the solutions are for this one 2x equals negative 5 so x equals negative 5 over 2 and this one is of course x equals 3 that's it that's it hope this is this one help guys let's move on okay question 19 so here is a graph of y equals hx cool so this graph looks to me like a cubic graph so let me zoom out a bit let me zoom out let me just da -da -da. zoom zoom out so yeah, if you look carefully, you can see this is clearly a cubic graph where it cuts off at exactly three points. One there at the origin and it looks like two. Okay, so let's go back in again, zoom in twice. So yeah, it looks like it. So what does it say? So what's the question now? So use the graph to find an estimate for the gradient of the curve y equals hx at minus one six. Okay, so a gradient, we just, so this shouldn't be too bad. This shouldn't be too bad. Let's find minus 1, 6. So minus 1, 6 conveniently is, of course, on the line. So it will be um, here, I believe. Oops. Here. Now, to find a gradient, all you have to do is draw a draw an equation of a tangent. And, to, and it must hit exactly one point, which is on that point. So let's try and get a tangent equation. So let me get a straight line. Give me a second. So line... It just has to be as straight as possible. It's kind of hard to do on this, actually. So, okay, I'm just going to do it like this for a second. So it has to hit at exactly one point. So you guys need to use a nice, you know, sharp ruler for this. So something like this, isn't it? So this, this would be our, our equation of a gradient. Uh, our equation of a tangent, sorry. Now we just ask ourselves, um, let's just pick two points. So we can see that it's going downwards. I'll pick two simple points. Firstly, one that hits the x-axis. So we can say, oh boy, this is hard actually to pick. Okay, let's pick here. This one looks nice. So this is 8.5-ish and minus 1.5. So one corner I could say here. Oops, red pen. Let's say this corner. So this could be, and we can, and yeah, of course, you can pick the, the point where it hits the gradient. So these are already two corners. So this would be minus 1, 6. And this could be uh, minus 1.5. And where are we at? We're at 8.5. Okay, easy. Very easy. And where's it here? Here's the y intercept about half. Okay, fine. To find. And estimate for the gradient. So the gradient is simply one way to do it is just simply it's just simply the change in y over the change in x. So m here equals the change in y over the change in x. So this is in terms of coordinates. So because we could set this as our first coordinate, so we could say so the first y coordinate is six and the second is minus one, and we're going to subtract this against our new coordinates, which is um, eight point five and minus one point five. So it'd be 6 take away 8.5 over 1 minus 1 take away minus 1.5. Easy. Now just literally throw this in your calculator and we'll do the same thing. Um, so we're going to get 6.5 take away. So, and by the way, you could do 8.5 take away 6 in, in another way around. You could do it then the other way around if you prefer. As long as you get um, a, cl a clear answer. So it'll be plus 1.5. 
So I got a gradient of negative 5. I think it could be negative, but it's, the gradient must be negative because it's going downwards. So it seems plausible to me. So by drawing a suitable straight line on the grid, which we did, find an estimate for the solution of, okay, we did this one, find an estimate for the solution of the equation hx equals 7 minus 2x. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. Okay, so um, let's, draw, let's draw this line firstly, yeah? How do we do it? So we can say, we can just draw two plus. So we can call this the x and the hx in this case. So you can say when x equals zero, what happens? Seven times minus two times zero will give us seven. And pick another easy point, say when x is one. So when x is one, seven minus two times one will give us five. So here, are, so these are coordinates we can draw. So we've got zero, seven, and one, five. Let's plot this in. So I'm gonna change pen actually. Let's change the color. So let's pick blue. Okay, zero seven one five. Where are you? Zero seven. So zero seven is is here, and one five is here. Now let's just draw a straight line. So insert line. Okay. So again, this is always hard to do because. It's right okay okay so let's just stretch out this line passing through this point and passing through the other one okay so it hits at exactly one point ish um, yeah i'll say it like this so it seems to hit around here. So what is this point? Let me just get the pen. So this coordinate here is about, let me just put it here. So this is two, so we've got these numbers all clustered. So that's about, let's see, straight line down. That's about 2.2, .2, isn't it? So this is 2.2 .2 here across the x-axis and on the y-axis is it's somewhere here, like in the middle-ish. Well, we could just say uh, 2.8, so about 2.8. So this should be the solution, 2.2, 2.8. Yep, that's right. It's cool. And sorry, I just had a moment to think over there. Just had a little brain fart. Okay, that's fine. Let's jump right back in. So part C. So the equation, this, this is definitely a hard paper, I have to admit. This is really challenging paper. I'm doing this without a solution, of course, but I'm fairly confident about this. Okay, finally, part C. So the equation hx equals k has three different solutions given in this interval. Okay, so when they say hx equals k, k could just be a straight line, any straight line. And, it, and it's, you can see that y is being replaced by k. Use this graph to find estimate for value a and b. Okay, so okay, so k is between a and b. So we look, it's looking like we want pretty much the max, the lowest possible value of a and highest possible value of b. In this case, k. So to get three solutions, we just need to draw a straight line that cuts through three points. But to be honest, it can be any line. So I guess the smartest thing to do is to draw a straight line across here and realize that it cuts firstly about here, which is, let's, let me just mark it on the line here. So if we, if we draw a straight line across here, so it'll be all the way across, okay, that's not straight. It'll be a line cutting the y-axis, a very straight line, horizontal line. And you can see the highest point is here, which is 8.2. So this would be a maximum value, because you because even if you hit a turning point, it still counts as two points because this is a cubic, and cubic graphs need three points. So we could say 8.2. Another way to get three solutions is to go at the absolute lowest. This would be the minimum. So the, the, the turning point at the minimum, which is negative four, will still give you three solutions. And anywhere between these values will give you exactly three solutions because it cuts everywhere. So we can say minus four and 8.2. That's what I'm going with. My, my gut feeling is saying minus 4 here and 8.2. Right, let's move on. Alright, so 20. So the histogram shows information about the time taken by 160 cyclists to complete the Tour de France cycle race. Oh, Tour de France, nice. So I might need to zoom out for this one as well. So we're given a histogram here. So it looks like it's quite a lot of information there. So we know, but at least we know all this sums up to 160, the total cumulative. Now we'll give you more information. Six cyclists took less than 85 hours. Okay. Firstly, 
I want to assume nobody began at this point, okay? So we can say that this area here would be 6. And we know that the total area of everybody is 160. Okay, so what can estimate for the number of the 160 cyclists who took less than 86 hours? So 86, less than 86 hours would be half of this block, and you add up these other, other blocks here. All right, so let's work out the, the, the value of the density and so on. So let's have a look, zoom in. Right, so we can say we've got a class width here of um, half, or in this case, 0 0.5, because 84.5 to this gives you a difference. Whilst well, our height here is 12. So this is quite easy, 12 times 0 0.5 would give you 6. That means this is easy to do, let's be honest. So this one again is, is half, this goes to a height of 20. So 0 0.5 times 20 will give us 10 here. And over here, the width is 1, because 85.5 to 86.5, so the width is 1, times a height of, so 15, so let me see, 11, so, got 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So be 1 times 16 is 16. And yeah, so and we can do the rest. So this will be 6 plus 10, and plus, because in this case we want to find less than 86 hours, it will be half of this block, so it will be 8. So 6 plus 10 plus 8 would be the estimate. And then adding this up together, 6 and 8 is 14, should get about 24. Nice. Okay, so for these 160 cyclists, work on estimate for the time taken by cyclists who finish in the 50th position. Okay, so the 50th position, so let's have a look. So in this case, we're looking at the ones closest to the beginning, because remember, the sooner they finish, the sooner the time, the earlier they finish. So you can see 6, 10, 16 represent the first, well, this, this amount represent the first 24 people. We need to get to the 50th. So let's keep counting the blocks here. So let's find out the area of this one. So this is from A6.5 to A8. So this looks like a width of 1.5. 1.5 times a height of, so 31. This is 36. So 1.5 times 36 should give us 54. Right, so now hmm, we have to do, we have to try and think about this carefully. So let's divide this block into three so we can find out every half interval because I'm guessing it'll be somewhere around here. So so far we've got six plus ten is sixteen, plus another sixteen is thirty-two. So so far we've got thirty-two people up until here. We need to find out another eighteen more to get to the fiftieth person. And actually, you know what? <laughs> Conveniently, if you divide fifty-four by three, you actually get eighteen. So if you divide into three individual blocks, this area are all worth 18 each. So actually this will make 50. So convenient, like I said, it will be 87 hours. 32 plus 18 is 50 person, 87. So I think that's why it's just worth two marks. Oops, not eight plus, 87, yeah. Okay, so it looks like we're on the last question now. So number 21. So a diagram shows a cube with A, B, C, D, F, G, H. And of course, we've got a point K. And we're given the following dimensions. We can see that the width of this cube is 21. We don't know what the, um, the length here is. Let's call it X if we ever need it. And the height is 9. K is the point on E, H such that the angle A, K, B is 68 degrees. So A, K, B is 68 degrees. And the length B, K is 16.5. Let's go ahead and just pop that in right now. So from, if we go from A to K, and then we go from, um, at another line, from B to K. So we've got an angle here, so let's get my pen, angle here of uh, 68 degrees, and we've got a length of BK, which is 16.5, okay? Let's try and keep that, keep that in mind. Calculate the size angle BAK. So BAK. So I oh this is not so bad. So we'll go find this angle here. Let's call it theta. So to do this, what do we have? So we've got 21 here, we've got 16.5 here, and we've got two angles. So let's redraw this triangle down here. It's always good to redraw problems. So make it simple, like this or something. So this angle here, the, the angle we're interested in is theta. We've got a length of 21 here, a length of 16.5. And an angle here of 68. Now we just ask ourselves, what is the best method to use? Well, 
you can see clearly that you got a length and angle on both opposite ends. So then the only rule to use would be the would be the sine rule. So sine rule. So this means, and the sine rule tells us that the formula is always um, a over sine a equals b over sine b, all upside down. So it's the ratio of the of the of the weights. So it's going to be therefore sine theta over 16.5 over its corresponding length equals sine 68 over its corresponding length, which is 21. Whew, sorry guys, I'm gonna be I'm just getting a bit tired. That's why I might sound a bit dead. And then to do this, you just multiply 16.5 across. So it'll be sine theta equals sine 68 over 21 times 16.5. And whatever you do, calculate this and just literally sign inverses in the calculator. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So let's have a look. Sine 68 over 21 times 16.5. So I've got some answers, 0 0.72, and then sign inverse that. Okay, I've got 46.8 to... Huh? What the hell? Yeah, 46... 0.8 degrees. All right. So is that is that it? No, that was that's part A. Okay. Here we are. The last question of the day. So we need to calculate the size of the angle between the line BK and the plane ABC, ABCD. So that sounds quite straightforward on paper, isn't it? We just want to find out this line as it makes an angle to this plane over here. But how could you actually see it visually? I mean, where does the line really connect? How do you make an how do you make a triangle? Well, if you think about it, if you put this into a 2D perspective, this would just be a lot easier. And I'll show you why. It's better to show you than to talk about it. So let me just get my shapes out. Oh, okay. Oops. Sorry. Bear me, guys. I somehow closed it. Open. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Here we go. So let's insert a shape here. Yeah? So a rectangle is put over here. So suppose this is the shape that we we're concerned about. Okay, so this is the, the 3D, this is the cuboid in a 2D map. And that means that we're gonna have two points. We're gonna have the point K over here. And we're also gonna have a point B here. Which if you, if and because it's 2D, this is also accounts point C, and this corner also accounts A and D. Because that's, that's, that's a 2D perspective of a 3D shape. And looking at this more carefully, we can see that this entire length is nine centimeters. And the line from BK is 16, so let me draw a straight line there. A straight line. Yeah, so that's 16.5. Let me write it down. And to find the angle of the plane, well, it, it needs to hit in the region of ABC. So, and because it's now in 2D perspective, in a 2D perspective, is now this angle here. This will be the angle we want. Let's call it X. But in fact, if we use trigonometry, it will probably be a lot easier to work out this angle first, y, and then subtract against 90 to find x. Because if you think about it, this is a right angle, you got, it's literally fit for Pythagoras' theorem, or trigonometry. So how do we do this? Well, firstly, looking at this, because this is angle y, we can call this side the opposite, which we don't need. So this makes 9 the adjacent. And of course, this is the long side, 60.5, so that's the hypotenuse. So using trig, we can use, um, I believe, cos. Because Sokatoa accounts for, in this case, the ka. We're only concerned about the ka. So this means we're going to have cos y equals adjacent 9 over hypotenuse 16.5. So let's write it down. So it'll be cos y equals 9 over 16.5. And that's it. So when you cos inverse this, what do you get? Oh, so not so bad, you know, I mean, for a while, personally, before I did this question, I did pause the video to actually have a look how to do it, but it turned out it was a quite, it's quite straightforward method. So, okay, so I got 56.94, so I might just put it down, let's put 56.9, and then you just subtract against 90. So 90 minus your answer, so in your calculator, you can just write 90 minus answer, if you have that feature, or type the value, and you should get 33.1 degrees. And that's it guys. I hope this video helped and let me know if you've got any questions, you know. I admit this last question was definitely the trickiest and it took me a while to really think about how to explain it to you guys. But yeah, please give me a feedback. Give me a like if you enjoyed this video. 
you know, just give me, just just let me know how you guys feel about everything, and you know, you can talk about your day in, in the conversation. But more importantly, you know, congratulations, well done if you made it this far into the paper. Give yourself a pat on the back and I shall see you guys in the next paper. Other than that, good luck in your exams and ciao.